Well, to recap from last week, we, we talked a little bit about the number of families that are fatherless in Canada, uh, you know, going through the statistics. And if you want to recap, you can go back and watch that message uh, on YouTube. It's on there, the shortened version. The effects of fatherlessness on a person, uh, both as a child and as they age as well. Fatherhood truly and completely stems from first knowing the father. And we really hit that home last week, and I wanted to pick up on that a bit more this week and, and walk through that process a little bit. But the reality is, and I, I, don't wanna, I don't want any of the dads to feel bad, but the reality is, is sometimes if we have to have a reevaluation process of how we've been doing life and how we've been living and what we've been kind of accomplishing in our lives, sometimes we need a reevaluation process and that does feel bad, but we need to take stock of where we're at so we can make better decisions for where we're going. We need to take stock of where we're at so we can make better decisions for where we're going. And we will actually never grow unless we know truly where we're at. And sometimes that means that we have to realize that maybe we've been doing things wrong, or we haven't been doing things fully, or maybe we've been in a spot in life where we really need to grow up, but we've refused to put away the childish things. But when it comes to being a dad, when it comes to being a father, when it comes to owning that role as a leader and a shepherd in your home for your kids, there's something that comes before you. And that's the people that you're caring for, the young ones, your children. They come before you. And what's amazing, what I find fascinating is that we have an example set for us through thousands and thousands of years of the gospel. We see God, our heavenly father, setting the ultimate example of what proper biblical fatherhood really is and the role that we ought to play as dads. Now, some young guys, you're probably like, well, I'm not a dad yet, or I don't actually even know if I'm a dad. It's the reality sometimes. But you will be at some point. And you can make decisions today that will affect your future, so much so that you can actually lead by leaving a legacy for your family. You can lead by leaving a legacy for your children. But you need to know first how to do that well and where that all starts from. Last week, we also learned that biblical fatherhood is leadership that's based upon shepherding. We talked about the sheepies, right? Close your eyes. There you are. You're in the field. You're under the shade of the tree. You've got all your sheepies around you. You have one job. You got one job. Let's take care of those sheepies. And you get distracted by video games or the latest movie or tinkering on something or doing all the things that you want to do and suddenly you get back in the picture and realize, oh my goodness, my sheepies are gone, dead, or destroyed. I don't know what I've done. Well, you haven't actually been a good shepherd. You haven't owned the responsibility of the role of leading your flock well. There's a job that a dad has to do, and it is an important job. Even though our society sometimes plays it up like dad is just the hapless moron on TV shows and he's not really that big of a deal, I promise you, when you look at all of the numbers, when you look at all the statistics, when you look at the outcomes over time, and we have got a lot of information to peer upon, you will find over and over and over again that the lack of a present father in the lives of their children has profound, profound negative effects on them as they grow up. And not only does it have profound negative effects on them as they grow up, it has profound negative effects on the generations that come under them. So yes, dads are called to be leaders. You could either lead well or you could lead poorly, but you're still going to be a leader and leaders leave legacy. You have a decision today but what kind of legacy you want to leave behind, not only for your children, but the generations that come after you. It's a choice that you can make. So we see that biblical fatherhood is leadership that's based upon shepherding. And when we look at shepherding, we have to look at the example of Christ as the ultimate shepherd. We see in scripture that Jesus is the real shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. And we can look at Christ and look at his example of how he shepherded and led well. And we can adopt those into our lives. We can adopt those examples and apply them to how we tend to our children. And I want this to sink in this morning. Dads, I want this to sink in this morning. If you are a father, 
you are a shepherd. If you are a father, you are a shepherd. Now, that might be lost on us a little bit in this day and age, so I don't really see too many shepherds around unless you go up to Pass Creek, maybe in Robson, I don't know. Grand Forks, there's a few of them. You might not understand the role of a shepherd, but the role of a shepherd is to actually care for and have responsibility for the things that he is in care of or in charge of. And there's something special to watch the ministry of Jesus because we as dads can apply that to the ministry of fatherhood. And yes, being a father is actually a ministry. Being a father is actually probably one of the most important ministries that you could possibly step into. And dads, I want you to write this down. If you have got a notepad or if you've got a smartphone or if you've got a tablet or you've got a Bible and you can flip to the notes section in the back and write this down on a piece of paper or if you're here and you don't have a piece of paper, in front of you there's tithing envelopes. And tell you what, you can take one home with you today and put notes on the back of it. It's amazing. You don't need to put money on it. You can take it with you and it will have great profound impacts on you as you jot some of these things down. I want you to write this down, dads. I am a father. I am a shepherd to my children. You can put that in the comment section down below if you're watching online. I am a father. I am a shepherd to my children. Now, there's things that we learn even before we step into those roles, but they affect how we are able to perform those roles and responsibilities. My dad taught me how to do things on vehicles when I was a kid before I even had a vehicle. Now, I didn't have a vehicle. I had no responsibility to take care of a vehicle, but he taught me how to do things on a vehicle. Change brakes, change tires, change oil. Don't change the transmission fluid because that's actually not the oil and you can't get it back into 2004 Volkswagens. You've heard the story before uh, if you've attended. Um, I'm not going to tell that today. But you learn things when you are young. Even though you might not be a dad in this moment, you will be in the future. And you can take these things and apply them when you get older. So from our recap of last week, I want you to remember that you are a father and you are a shepherd to your children. I know this can be a touchy subject because we live in a society where some of us and some of you here don't have dads. You've never known your dad. Your dad abandoned you. Uh, some of you who are attending are single moms and you don't have uh, your husband in the home or a partner in the home and you're trying to raise your children on your own. And these things, these, these types of teachings can be very challenging and I understand that. But please know that as we approach this subject matter, it's not from a place of making anyone trying to, trying to make anyone feel bad or remorseful. As a matter of fact, it's coming from a place of let's get a good baseline of what works well. Let's get a good baseline of what we can look at for goal setting, what we can look at for being better in our future and let's endeavor to move forward well you can't go back but today you can change where you're going you can write that down if you want to that's a good one you can't go back but today you can change where you are going and today we want to take a close look at what the qualifications of a father really are we want to take a close look at what the qualifications of a father really are. And again, this can be scary because it means that if there's qualifications, it means that maybe you could be disqualified. And that's sort of nerve-wracking, right? And especially when you reflect, like, man, I have moments, I have off moments often where I reflect on all the times that I have done a poor job at being a dad. I reflect on that often. And if you're a dad here, I'm sure you have had those moments as well, where you're like, you're, you know, you're driving to work and, and you just have, you hear something on the radio or a song, maybe it's Baby Shark, do, 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 Baby Shark, and it brings you back to you know, bouncing your kids on your knee, or you have these things that kind of come up in your mind and, and it just hits you like a ton of bricks, like, oh man, I really messed up in this area. I did not do a good job at being a dad. We've got to face things so that we can change things. You can stuff it all down and pretend that's not real, or you can reckon with it and ask God to help you through it. Remember, you can't go back, but today you can change where you're going. As a dad, as a father, you're actually called to be a leader in your home, take care of the needs of your children and your family but I also recognize that much of that and your ability to accomplish those things stems from your own personal journey and your own personal hurts and challenges. 
If you didn't have a dad, the likelihood of you being an amazing dad is probably going to be diminished, statistically. Is that a bad thing? Well, that's just the reality. But can it be changed? Yes, it can. Because there are men around you that can come alongside of you and sharpen you and encourage you and call out better for you. Not out of a place of belittling, but of a place of encouragement. And just because you happen to be a father doesn't by default mean that you're actually walking in the biblical qualifications. I got a lot of guys that come into my office and, and you know, this is actually going to be a topic in the future that we're going to hit on probably in the new year, talking about being a biblical husband. And all the dads and husbands are like, holy crap, I feel bad enough already about life. I don't know if I can go through the husband one. Um, but you know what? It's actually good. It's a good one to go through. It's actually good for the gals and it's good for the guys. It's good for the gals to know that the Bible actually calls husbands to account to be a certain type of man. Uh, and, it, and it also is good for the guys to realize, okay, I've got a checklist I can follow and I can do these things and it will be better. Better. Uh, us guys, we need that. So we'll talk about that in the future. But just because you happen to be a father doesn't by default mean that you're walking in biblical qualifications of what fatherhood really is. If you endeavor to take the Bible seriously, you'll discover that these qualifications, like I said earlier, also mean that there's opportunity for disqualification. That's right. Some of us have been fathers and we actually have no business being fathers. We have no business trying to raise children because we're not even in a position to even know what it's like to be an adult ourselves. We're still childish in the way that we think or the way we operate. But there is a desperate need to get on track with what it is to really appropriately step into the role of being a father. It's a little scary sometimes when you look at it. It can seem daunting. But when I look at what we find in the scriptures surrounding being an appropriate leader, being an appropriate shepherd, being an appropriate father, when I look at what we find in the scriptures, I actually love the fact that me, in and of myself, James, it's actually impossible for me to be an amazing dad. It's actually impossible for me to meet every single one of these qualifications that we see in the Bible. And, and you might ask, like, well, well, you're up there teaching about this, you're preaching about this, you're sharing about these qualifications, and you're saying that you can't even do those things yourself? Like, no, I can't, actually. Just like I can't torque the lug nuts on my tires by myself when I was a child. I needed my dad to step in and help. And whether you're eight or whether you're 80, you are still a child in the grand scheme of eternity, and you do need your Heavenly Father's help. No matter what, you need help from God because He is your Heavenly Father. You need to know your Heavenly Father so that you can be a great earthly father. And I can't meet these qualifications on my own, and there are times where I am a mess. I don't even know which way is up or which way is down. I am not even on the spectrum of even making a mark on the scorecard. And it's in those times where I fail miserably that I have to stop, I have to take stock, I need to repent of the areas that I have caused trouble in, and then I need to say, God, I need your help because I can't do this on my own. So, where do we find these qualifications of being a good shepherd? Where do we find these qualifications of what it is to be an appropriate leader? A leader that leaves a good legacy? Well, again, on your you know, offering envelopes, or maybe in your notebooks, or the back of your Bible, or on a piece of paper, I want you to write these passages of Scripture down. You're going to find that this list actually is outlined in the Bible. So the first section we're going to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, uh, verses 1 through 7. You can jot that down. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. If you're writing in the comment section, write down 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7, and that way it'll be on the comment section for all of eternity. You can go back and reference that. Uh, the second reference is Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. And the third one is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. 
I want you to write these down. Okay, ladies, here's the deal. You're like, well, he's been talking about fatherhood for two weeks, and I'm not a father. I'm not really sure what this has to do with me. Okay, here's the deal. If, you have, if you've got a checklist for your future, Mr. Wright, um, make sure that these things are on the checklist. Okay? So if you've got a checklist for your future, Mr. Wright, I know my daughter does, Paige. Not to make you feel awkward. Everybody stares at her. It's like, oh, she's like, crap, dad. I'm going to get mad at you later. Um, it also says, do not uh, provoke your children in the Bible, and I just missed the mark on that one. Um, so, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so if you're, if you're a lady and you're checking this out, whether you are married or whether you're single, what's really neat is you can look at this list, and you can go through this list and be like, hmm, my man is not like that. We need to have a discussion. Uh, or, because that's how all the ladies talk, or if you are a gal and you are thinking about prospective suitors, um, we have a suitor program here at the church, by the way, 1-800-PASTOR-JIMS-SUITING-SHOP. I don't know. Um, uh, if you're single and you want to get married, just come talk to us and we will get you hitched. We, uh, we take a small dowry, goats and chickens, and... Uh, we donate them to Operation Feast. Okay, there we go. That's my, that's my little thing. I, 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 told, I figured I could slide that in there. We really, you know, if you want to make some donations to Operation Feast, we can maybe do some marriages and we'll accept goats and chickens for the marriage ceremonies. Oh, boy. I've got all the rebels over here. There, some of the rebels from the hockey team, they're single, and they're like, oh, there's single ladies. <clears throat> Lady, single ladies, check your list. Okay, check your list. Uh, it's very important. Okay. Oh boy. ADD medication is going strong this morning. You know what I said? I had a donut before the service and there was sugar in it. And uh, it's going to stand up comedy act right now. It's going to get, we're going to get really, this is going to be serious. I got to stay on track. Maria, focus. Focus, Maria. Pay attention. Uh, okay. You're getting a glimpse right now into the mind, in my mind. It's just does this. It, it, it's Maria's life, my mind, Maria's life, and it is a good thing there are no squirrels in here because it would, just, it would be a disaster. Pure mayhem. Okay, listen, focus, focus. Ladies, not ladies, men. It's 2020, nobody thinks about ladies and men anymore, but we're talking about ladies and men of the church today. We're talking about fathers. Okay, here we go. So, we're talking about the biblical qualifications of a godly leader, okay? The biblical qualifications of a godly leader. And guys, you can apply this to your role as a dad. Fathers, you can apply this to your role as a dad. Is this list of qualifications going to make you feel extremely unqualified? I promise you, you will feel very unqualified after we go through this list and you'll think, Matt, I might as well just give up right now. I don't even have a chance. Don't be quitters. Rise to the occasion. Be a man. Step out. And step in to the role that God has actually called you to step into. Don't just neglect it or pass it on to somebody else. Own it. Walk in it. Champion it well. And lead by leaving a legacy that is good. Okay? So, here we go. We've got the scriptures. You've got them in your notes. They're probably up on the screen. That's great. Oh, people are bartering chickens and goats, actually, for their children right now. This is... We need to nix those from the comment section below because we are not going to give kids or young ladies away for chickens and goats. Um, biblical qualifications. There are 26 of them that we see in the Bible. 26 qualifications of a godly leader. And we can apply this to being a godly father, a biblical father. And just imagine as we go through this list, imagine for a moment that you, dad, in your home, applied these principles for your children. Set the example for your children. Just imagine that you applied these in your home and think of the consequences that they might have. Consequences aren't always bad. There can actually be very positive outcomes from applying good structure in your life, but it means you got to apply it. So you might feel bad when we go through these, but don't worry, because God is the one who will equip you to have these characteristics as you lean on him. So write these down. You can write them down in your notes. Pay attention. Number one, being above reproach. Number two, the husband of one wife. That's what the Bible says. It might be a touchy subject. I totally get it. 
There's some of you that have 18 wives, and it's a hard one, I know, I get it. But I'm just saying, the Bible has a good recipe for how things work. Number three, raising believing children. It's teaching your kids how to believe in God. Number four, being sober-minded. Number five, not arrogant. Number six, not quick-tempered. Number seven, self-controlled. Number eight, respectable. Number nine, hospitable. Number 10, a lover of good. Number 11, upright. Number 12, holy. Number 13, disciplined. Number 14, holds firm to the word of God. That means operates in conviction. Number 15, able to give sound instruction. Number 16, able to refute bad instruction. Number 17, able to teach. Number 18, not a drunkard. Number 19, not violent, but rather gentle. Number 20, not quarrelsome or starting arguments for no reason. Ladies, I know this has happened in your homes. This has happened in my home. I've started arguments for no reason. Remember, I can't do all these things without Jesus. So let's just carry on here. Not a lover of money, number 21. Number 22, not greedy. Number 23, a good manager of their household. If you are looking for a future husband, ladies, uh, Does he manage his current household situation well, or is he still living with mom and dad and she's still doing the laundry for him? Make sure he can manage his own household well before you jump into all the marriage relationship business. Hmm? Do I do my own laundry? Maria, this is not about me today. Do we? We offer free counseling at the church. And I need some. So whoever offers that free counseling, I need it now. Uh, Okay. Uh, Able to do their own laundry. No, that's not it. Uh, What was it here? Able to manage their own household. Uh, Number 24, uh, able to keep their children in check. Number 25, not just a new convert. Number 26, well thought of by outsiders and the community. When you go through that list, it can seem terrifying. I'll post this list. We'll post this list online on our Facebook page so you can look at this list as well later because I actually have some homework for you with this list that I want you to take with you. And this is, this is kind of why. I'm not going to give you all the answers today because I'll be frank with you, I don't have all the answers. I'm 37 years old. I've had the joy and the honor of raising my children. They're not out of the house yet. My oldest biological daughter is almost 16. My youngest is 13. They're wonderful children. My adopted son is 24. And I can't definitively say what works and doesn't work because they haven't launched out yet and they're not on their own in the world. I I don't have an opportunity to, to be able to quantify that or figure that out. Do I hope that they do well? Yes, I do. Do I pray daily for them? Constantly, sometimes moment by moment. I can't give you all the answers of what works and what doesn't work because I haven't been there yet. But somebody has gone before me who does have all the answers. And when I'm floundering and struggling and not able to do it and recognizing very well that I have tremendous deficiencies, I need to press into Jesus constantly. But I also need to pull up my socks and get to work as a dad because there is a job that needs to get done. Biblical fatherhood calls for a different standard of leadership. When we look at this, and if we apply this standard of leadership to all facets of leadership in our lives, it's a very challenging list to meet up to. The standard is difficult. But you know what? I actually think that's okay. I think that's okay that the standard is a difficult one to hit. Because the calling of being a dad should be higher than just being able to sleep with a gal and make a baby. The calling of raising a child, and not only just one, but maybe many, and then generations after that, so much so that they will live on this earth and affect the world around them, that call should be more than just shacking up for a one-night stand. There is more to being a biblical dad than just simply having a baby. There is a call and a standard upon the lives of men 
as they father children to be present and active and available in the lives of their kids to teach them well, to grow them well, to encourage them well, and to send them out so that they can thrive. And what happens when you become a dad is you put away your stuff for the sake of them. And it is a short period of time that we do that, but it is crucial. And if you remember from last week, I opened with saying I really struggled in August with my frustration around this subject because I often watch men in the community, but also men in the Christian community, actively choose to neglect their children for their own personal pursuits. And their children suffer tremendously because of it. And that is not the badge of Christianity that we deserve to wear if that is how we're going to act. We don't get to bear the name Christian and refuse to grow up and raise our children well. We don't get to bear the badge Jesus follower and then go and raise children that we've never seen, known, or have actively neglected. You see, Jesus set an example so wild that he came, he brought people on a journey with him, he didn't punish them, but rather he disciplined and discipled them. He loved them and he ministered to them. He gave to them. He didn't expect them to give to him. And then ultimately, at the end of it all, Jesus gave his life for those ones. He gave his life for the ones that he raised. He gave his life for his disciples. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. He gave his life for your neighbor. He gave his life for your children. He gave his life for everybody in the entire world. He gave it as a gift selflessly for them. That is the role of a dad. It is hard work, yes, it is a difficult task. Yes, it is daunting 100%. Are there days where you're going to have to walk up that mountain and cry because you can't keep it together? I guarantee it 100% happens to me usually once a week. But the reality is, is that Jesus has gone before you. He's already done that work. You get to look at his example. And when you can't figure it out, he shores it up for you. Where you have failed in the past doesn't mean you need to keep failing in the future. If you're watching today and you're a dad and you have not been active in the lives of your children, regardless of their age, it is never too late to start turning that around. Because if anything, you can go to them and say, I need to repent for how I was as a dad to you. I need to repent for my absence. I need to repent for my attitude. I need to repent for my abuse towards you. I need to repent for my neglect towards you. I need to repent. And the reason why I'm repenting is because Jesus has changed my life. And don't let it stop there by just saying the words. Let them see over time that your life has actually been transformed. You can set a new example for your children, no matter what their age ages so that they know Jesus remedies the brokenness. Our society is full, 1.17, sorry, 1.7 million single parent homes in Canada. 1.7 million single parent homes in Canada, 87% of those only have moms. We need dads that can rise up and accept the challenge of what it is to be robust Accept the challenge of what it is to teach well. Accept the challenge of what it is to set an appropriate example. Accept the challenge of what it is to actually say sorry and change their ways. We need dads who can rise up and lead by setting a different example. We need dads that will choose to rise up and lead by way of having a new legacy. Biblical fatherhood, this set of standards, it calls for a different type of leadership than maybe what we've ever known. And it's not a list to shame you. Not at all. As I've read through this stuff personally, I, I didn't necessarily feel ashamed, but I felt inadequate. And, and trust me, that's hard to deal with because I do not like feeling inadequate. As I wrestle with this personally, I do feel inadequate 
Some days I feel like I'm just hitting home runs and everything's great. Other days I'm like, man, I am failing bad at this. But what I find quite miraculous is I can come home after recognizing full well that I am a bit of a disaster sometimes in the eyes of the Lord. I can come home and by God's grace, I know he has been ministering to my kids and he's doing an amazing job where I just simply can't. And I think as a dad, there's this incredible partnership we can have with our Heavenly Father where we begin to realize that he has a grace that abounds upon our lives. And as long as we endeavor to surrender and submit to to him and walk in his will and in his way, he picks up the pieces that we just can't. That doesn't give us an excuse to not even worry about picking up pieces. But what it does is it helps us realize that as dads, we don't have to go at it alone. Imagine if you applied these principles to your home. Imagine if you applied it to your life and to your children's lives. Imagine how things would change. It seems scary because the task might be so overwhelming, you can't imagine how it could possibly change. But I promise you, as you surrender to God and say, I can't do this on my own, I need your help, I promise you, you will begin seeing a difference. Give it time and let his work take root. I know God's got a benchmark for how dads are supposed to be. And I actually find it encouraging, even though it's difficult. I find it encouraging because God calls us to actually be better. He doesn't call for us to remain broken. He calls for us to walk in restoration. So I'm going to post this list up on our Facebook page, and you're welcome to go and take a look at it. And this is what I want you to do. Dads, this is a bit of a homework assignment for you. If you're an older dad, you're like, man, I quit doing homework back in the 50s. Um, But that's okay, uh, because you can still do a little bit of homework, and it might be fun or scary. Tell you what. If you're brave enough, you're going to do it, okay? Guys need a little bit of that sometimes. I want you to take this list. It's 26 qualifications. I want you to look at them, and I want you to write down your three good ones. The strongest ones that you know that you've got nailed. There's 26 there, so you can pick three. You don't have to have them all figured out, but pick three that you know that you've got nailed. But I also want you to pick your three weakest ones. I want you to contemplate that. Pick your three weakest ones. Now, I don't want you to share your answers. They're for you and you alone. If you're married, I want you to ask your wife to do the same thing. I want you to ask your wife to identify your three strongest ones and your three weakest ones. It's going to be fun, isn't it? Yeah, office is open for counseling. Maria's already calling mine out. He can't do laundry, doesn't fold his own socks, can't even deal with this man. That's your accent, right? So here's the deal. I want you, husbands, dads, you write down your three top ones, you write down your three low ones, and then go to your spouse, ask them to write down what they see as your top three and your bottom three. Don't fight about it. All right? I know you're going to want to. You're going to want to leave the house. You need to, I need to go for a walk. You're going to clean your guns downstairs or something. Whatever it is you do, just, <laughs> uh, just calm down. Breathe. The pastor's preparing you. He's letting you know that this might be challenging, but it'll be revealing and helpful. You might have to think about it for a bit. You might have to wrestle with it a little bit. And that's okay. But I want you to discuss these things with your spouse. Now you're thinking, well, Pastor James, what if I don't have a spouse? What if I'm just a single dad and I'm raising my kids and I don't have a spouse that I can talk to? I'll tell you what, you probably got a friend. You probably have a real friend who doesn't just tell you that you're amazing and you're wonderful all the time, but it can actually just give you a good old kick or a slap and say, smarten up, and then you can go and hang out together. So get a real friend, a good friend, and do the same thing. I believe 
that God calls dads to be better. Worship team, I'll call you up. I believe that God calls dads to be better. I believe that God has a standard for fatherhood that is better than anything that we could ever imagine doing on our own. I believe that God's standard for being a dad and being a father will have the best outcomes long term. It will have the best outcomes for leaders. It will have the best outcomes for leaving a legacy. And I also believe that God has called us to rise to the occasion. Young single guys, you can do this exact same exercise as well. And actually, I would encourage you to because your life right now is all about preparing for your future. Your life right now is all about preparing for your future. So you can do this exact same thing. And I want you to contemplate that and wrestle with it. And I'm guessing if you're like me when I've gone through this, you're going to have to wrestle with some stuff. Maybe your partner or your spouse or your friend is going to call some stuff out in you that you do not like to hear. They don't hate you. They don't want to ruin you. They want to see you improved and help you grow. So it's going to be all right. And you know, all the pieces that I can't manage to cover this morning and all the things that I can't manage to instill this morning are wonderful because God actually gets to do that. When I wrestle with these things and I see this list and I, and I look through the state of, uh, I look at the state of our society and, our, and the world around us and how challenging it can be and how difficult it is when we don't see dads operating the way that God has called them to and we see society fall apart and it becomes messy and, and not only that, we see children ruined and broken by a lack of a good, healthy dad in their lives, it can be disheartening to look at just the reality of where things are. But where I actually have hope, a lot of it, and where I actually find it quite exciting and interesting, is I know God changes people. I know he does. He's changed me, and I've watched him change the lives of so many others that I know. And what I also like about that is it's not something then that I have done to affect a change. It's something that God has accomplished. And if you're watching and you're listening and you're taking all this in and you're wrestling with this, keep wrestling with it. Keep wondering about it. Today, you have an opportunity to change the direction of where your future is going. Today, you have the opportunity to rise to the occasion and do something different. Today, you have the opportunity to set a different course for the legacy that you leave behind through your leadership. I don't know each of your personal situations. If you're watching, I certainly don't. You might be tuning in from who knows where. But God knows. And if you're honest with yourself, you probably know. You probably know that it might be time to change. It's never a bad thing. Sure, it's awkward. Sure, it takes time. Sure, it's uncomfortableness. But you have a choice today to change the direction of your future. And I sort of hope that you feel like you can't do it. I kind of hope that you feel you can't do it. I hope the task is actually so daunting that it makes you feel sort of nauseous inside. I really don't know how this is going to pan out. Because it's in those moments of weakness that we actually get to see God's strength. And that's pretty awesome. And when you start seeing the strength of your dad, (laughs) you can't wait to go to the playground and tell everybody else that your dad is stronger than all the rest of theirs. There's a confidence that comes from knowing that we are sons and daughters of the real father. So dads, today I'm calling you to be leaders who leave legacies. Doesn't matter where you are, dads, I am calling you this morning to be leaders who leave legacies.
Make the changes today so that your children can thrive in the future. Make the choices today so they can have life in abundance. Teach them through example how you've had to surrender so that they can watch their dad follow his heavenly father. God, I thank you for dads. I thank you that you've called us to something more than the standard that the world is God. Thank you that the standard that you've called us to is a tough one to meet. I thank you that we need you to even start scraping the surface. <laughs> I thank you that you are faithful to agitate the mess in our lives. I thank you that your Holy Spirit touches us in such a way that our challenging behaviors become chafed. We notice them. We recognize them. So we can face them and see them, deal with them. I thank you, Lord, that where we can't follow through, you are faithful. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you touch the lives of each and every single dad here in this place, every dad that's watching, and call them to something more. Instill in their hearts a desire to rise to the occasion being a biblical father. I pray for all the moms who are raising kids without a dad in the picture. Give them your peace and give them your patience, Lord. Give them your strength in those trying times. And Lord, I ask that you call the dads in the church, the grandpas in the church, rise to the occasion and fill in the areas that need to be shored up. And Father, finally, I thank you for being my Heavenly Father. Thank you for caring about the state of my eternity more so than the state of my life here. Be with your church this morning, Lord. Minister to them. Bless them. Holy name we pray.